Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tina Panic from the Avon Library and welcome to the fourth webinar in our 2023 series. Um, we will be recording this and sending it out to everyone tomorrow. Please use the chat box or the Q&A for any questions. Ask them at any time. We'll go over them at the end. Um, and I will now toss it to Terry Wilson from the Historical Society to thank everyone and introduce our speaker. Thanks, Tina. Good evening and welcome back from the summer break. On behalf of the Avon Historical Society, the Library and the Senior Center and the Planning Committee for Unearthing History, I welcome you to the fourth webinar in year three of educational and informative events, mostly covering the paleo people, animals and land of 12,500 years ago in this region. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, welcome. For those who have been with us along this whole journey, welcome back. And for those of you joining us from Vermont, happy Archaeology Month. Ours will be next month. We thank our partners, the Avon Land Trust, the Farmington River Watershed Association, and the Institute for American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut. This year's series is sponsored again by a grant from the Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Committee. The Farmington River played an enormous role in the life of indigenous people in this area, so we're very grateful for the grant support. The origin of this webinar series is the discovery in 2019 of the Brian D. Jones Paleo-Indian site along the Farmington River here in Avon, Connecticut. To learn more, please visit the Avon Historical Society's website and drop down the page for the Brian D. Jones site. Tonight, we're going on a journey that I'm sure, pretty, pretty sure none of us have ever seen. It takes us to a time when a large sea was just to our north. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Francis Jess Robinson, Vermont State Archaeologist. He works for the Division of Historic Preservation in Montpelier. He's not only an archaeologist, but he has a degree in literature too, so he makes him a good storyteller. He has a bachelor's from UVM, a master's from the University of Kent in England, and a PhD from University of Albany in SUNY. Good thing he studied literature because he's authored and co-authored many journals, book chapters, and conference papers. So let's welcome Jess. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the invite and to all the people tuning in from Vermont. Uh, again, um, appreciate uh, you tuning in for Vermont Archaeology Month. Um, let me just share my screen uh, here. Yes, so I'm obviously quite aware of the the Brian D. Jones site. Uh, David Leslie has, has shared critical information with me over, over the last few years and things that I've been working on. Um, it really is a generational or, or game-changing site um, and informs things that I'm working on now, which, will, which I'll touch upon in the last portion of this lecture tangentially. Uh, but... What I want to talk to you about tonight is uh, my area of research, along with my uh, colleagues who I don't want to neglect, John Croc, who's a professor at the University of Vermont and uh, the director of the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program, and Weatherby Dorsho, a PhD out of uh, the University of New Mexico, but also um, the the principal at Earth Analytica GIS firm, and, and we'll, I'll be showing some of that here. And as you can see, the, the title of my talk tonight is Paleo-Indian Sites, Site Patterning, and Travel Corridors Along the Southern Arm of the Champlain Sea. So what I want to do is just give a brief overview, which many of you have been turning into the series. Um, I'm sure probably know about the Paleo-Indian period, but with a particular bent towards what I'm interested in or what I think the archaeology can reveal uh, in relative to the Northeast. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back. Things are operating very slow. Okay, there we go. So this is uh, what the Northern Hemisphere looked like at the height of the last glacial maximum around 24,000 years ago. Um, if you notice up in the upper left, that is the New England slash Maritime Peninsula all the way down to Long Island, covered in some cases up to a mile of glacial ice. All of that ice was um, storing an enormous amount of planetary water, which made 
uh, the oceans lower uh, by hundreds of meters or, you know, several hundred feet. And um, this is this is a kind of complex graph, but it's one I like to show when I'm teaching uh, students um, and and discussing climate change over the last hundred years because it has a bearing not only on the people of the Paleo Indian period, but also uh, tangentially what we are looking at today. And that is um, this graph on the right, which is a, a measure of calcium concentration over the last hundred thousand years. And as you can read on the right, uh, essentially what it measures isn't how hot or how cold it is, how warm or how, uh, I mean, how uh, wet or how dry, but rather just environmental dynamism, the periodicity of storms, the, uh, the, the, the droughts versus the, um, the floods. Because calcium is a light element, it floats uh, lightly on the atmosphere and it gets nestled into gl glaciers when things seem to be going wrong. And as a proxy, it is a good sort of indicator of just rapid environmental change. And so as you can see on the right of the blue line, 100,000 years ago through 80,000 years ago, yes, there's a few blips, but they are, you know, relatively manageable. It's fairly stable. Then around 70,000 years ago, things start to go quite wild. This is the last pulse of the Ice Age. And the ups and downs are, are quite significant, quite dramatic, and not predictable. And um, this, this last 100,000 year period was the period where modern humans came into being. And yet, you can imagine that if you cannot predict where you could put your village, where you could put your fish weir, because you had no guarantee that the fish would come up the rivers the next year, or you would be able to collect nuts the following season, um, that it necessitated a hunter-gatherer fisher lifeway. And this continued all the way through until uh, the last pulse of this dynamism at around 13,000 years ago. Um, or, or slightly before, that we call the Younger Dryas. And this, after a brief period of, of, of um, settled and warmer temperatures, um, resulted in decreased accumulation rates of methane, increased dust, um, much lower conditions for temperature, seven, seven, um, negative seven uh, Celsius. And um, that is the period that is not encompassing, but somewhat defines the Paleo-Indian period, broadly speaking. And that period seems to have been the last gasp for Pleistocene megafauna. Uh, they had lived in North America for uh, millions or hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of years, depending upon the species and genera. Um, but this was the area of mastodons and mammoths, camels, American horses, saber-toothed cats, uh, uh, dire wolves. All of these things roughly began to go extinct right around this last pulse. Some of them thousands of years before, some of them not quite yet. And in fact, here's just a list of uh, the 33 genera, not species, but genera of megafauna that went extinct at or near the end of the Pleistocene epoch. Now, a lot of that assuredly, and, and what modern scholarship suggests, was due to uh, a changing climate, loss of, uh, of feed and, and prey, depending upon the, the animal. Um, but quite early on, um, people began to wonder why these, these large animals died out. And it was a subject of wonder. And I, I show here just an early painting by Charles Wilson Peel um, showing the, the energy and um, curiosity involved in excavating out some of these uh, remains of mastodon and mammoth and eventually other 
other um, um, species that had since long gone extinct. And so it was known that there were these ancient beasts roving on the American landscape. No one had any idea when at that point or how long they had been um, extinct. The, the, the nearest analogs were the cave paintings in France and uh, in Spain and in other areas of Europe that hinted to a great antiquity, but no one knew how long uh, because there were no absolute dating techniques. But a relative dating technique in 1927 um, at Folsom, New Mexico, uh, really revolutionized American deep time or deep ancestry uh, archaeology. And that was when uh, eroding out of an arroyo, uh, extinct uh, bison bones were found in direct proximity to distinctive spear points. And eventually, the uh, the leading authorities from the Smithsonian and the Denver Museum and others came out and corroborated the direct association. And this became began the the um, both study of and sort of a fever in studies of early quote unquote early man in um, in North American archaeology. And of course, as we all know, if, if we've been lit tuning in uh, previously, um, the Paleo-Indians or these early native people on the landscape made very, very distinctive uh, spear points, quite expertly crafted uh, in general, um, made with often very distinctive ribbon flaking phenomenon going across uh, the, the surface of the point. But the last step which was the most precarious, involved driving a channel up the center of the point on either side, which even today, as, as many of you uh, watching might know, is sort of the mark of a, of a flint napping or a person who replicates uh, ancient flint napping uh, stonework techniques um, is the mark of an, of an expert. It resulted even with people, native people of the Paleo-Indian period that were practicing this technique day to day uh, resulted in a, a rate of breakage around 10%. Um, so it was something that had a lot of, um, I would argue, both utilitarian, but also social and perhaps cosmological importance in doing it. And this is the only time in the in the Native American archaeological record where people made spear points the same way, roughly from uh, Washington State to Vermont to uh, northern Florida to northern Mexico the same way. Forever after, beyond that point, things became regionalized, uh, things people began to make things their own way, predicated largely or perhaps um, only partially on their own environment. But this was a pan-continental phenomenon. Sometime after Folsom, New Mexico, but not long after, uh, other archaeological sites spurned on by the discoveries at Folsom resulted in in, in uh, archaeological sites at Blackwater Draw, which you can see all of the the um, uh, faunal remains here, which are now under a big dome at Northern Arizona University, um, which include camel and mastodon and mammoth and in, in, in uh, extinct bison, other animals um, that hint at this large uh, predation of megafauna. Here's just a, a picture of some of the spear points recovered from Blackwater Draw, otherwise known as the Clovis site. And so uh, this marriage of early Paleo-Indian sites with Pleistocene megafauna uh, was an early and very, very compelling story told by the popular press, interested in by early archaeologists, um, and uh, became a narrative that was, that was very prominent in both pro uh, popular and scholarly media. Uh, 
The other thing that came along in the 1950s or so was the discovery of um, caches and more rigorous um, uh, professional archaeology that began to study, well, what are, what are the Paleo-Indian native people making these beautiful spear points and other scraping implements, uh, the various aspects of their toolkit from? And it was discovered that in a, in a remarkable example here at, that we see at the Fen Cache, um, people were making uh, tools from select sources of extremely high quality stone that were sometimes hundreds of kilometers away from the sites where uh, these materials were found, sometimes many hundreds of kilometers. And the, the prominent notion in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, sometimes even today, is that that was because uh, Paleo-Indians were reliant upon these huge megafauna for their existence. Those were the large packages of meat wandering around the landscape. They required a very specialized and very high quality toolkit to dispatch those animals and that there was no margin for error. And then therefore it was worth the time and effort to procure those uh, materials by whatever means um, uh, in order to have the reliability of being able to kill them. Otherwise you would probably starve. And, you know, so I, I'm so showing somewhat hyperbolic um, and, uh, you know, frankly, in some cases, ludicrous uh, dioramas of various uh, museum exhibits that have occurred over the last uh, 40 or 50 years showing this narrative in, in diorama display. So uh, people running up to a, a mammoth in a, in a trapped in a bog. Uh, stabbing him with or her with spears um, somewhat logical I mean that might have been a way to dispatch a, a large animal like that um, going on to this really ridiculous diorama again these are North American dioramas it seems like they're in the middle of a you know a, a jungle setting um, and you know uh, it begins it becomes increasingly a little bit ludicrous. It's a sort of a half uh, mammoth, half uh, uh, mammoth, again, trapping them in, in mud-like settings. Here's, you know, not even a pretense to put uh, hair on the, the mammoth or make it anything other than a scary beast. And now there's, it's just when it's walking across a river, um, you know, and, 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 the interpretations of the native people here are, are you know, conspicuously with loincloths and, you know, um, uh, primitivist and aren't at all flattering to uh, either what I would contend is the archaeological reality or the native people that they're hoping to, um, to depict. Here's a more nuanced uh, view that came out in a Smithsonian series in the 1970s that uh, displays them, you know, hunting in what would likely be appropriate garb for the time, given a given a winter hunt, um, uh, a, a migrating herd of caribou, them on the lookout. This could certainly be applicable uh, to native people in the Northeast and native people in Vermont. But is it the only story? And that's what I'd like to spend the next uh, little bit of time talking about. And um, this is um, research that has gone on by my colleagues uh, and I over the last few years. But I'd like to give you a, a, a background of sort of the environment at um, the, the beginning of the time period that we call uh, the Paleo-Indian period in the Northeast and a bit before. So, as opposed to the notion that um, Paleo-Indians were peripatetic wanderers in search of these large megafauna, uh, information from Bollinger and Lyman in 2014 and other papers that I won't cite here 
show that region wide there is extremely very little overlap between megafauna uh, and uh, dated Paleo Indian sites. In fact, almost none in in um, this region. And again, Paleo Indians were living slightly earlier, at least about 500 years earlier, in other areas of the continent, in the in the southwest, in the in the northwest, um, the the quote unquote true Clovis period, but glaciers had, had just recently receded by that point, and the area was not really habitable until at least about 13,000 years ago, and I would contend in Vermont until about 2,700 years ago. Here's just another example of a dated uh, megafauna, terrestrial megafauna uh, localities and dated Paleo-Indian sites. And recently, uh, an article came out with the earliest or the, the latest dated radiocarbon uh, date from a mammoth or a mastodon in the New England region. And that is in Vermont in Mount Holly. Um, and it dates to between about uh, 12,880 years ago to about uh, 12,800 years ago. What I would argue is prior to European, uh, not European, I'm sorry, native presence in Vermont, but quite close. So getting back to the to the um, sort of environmental timeline. At around 13,300 years ago, glaciers, which had been receding and melting since at least about 18,000 years ago, uh, had filled up the Northeast with enormous glacial lakes in some of these valley lake basins. And here you can see a picture of, of the biggest um, of them. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but um, in the Connecticut River Valley, you have glacial Lake Hitchcock, which is impounding an enormous amount of glacial meltwater, again, um, coming off from the melting of the, of, of the glaciers, that, the Laurentide Glacier that was receding in the north. In the, in the Champlain and in the Hudson Valley, at its largest um, or, or um, uh, greatest extent, it was a confluent um, lake that spanned from the glacial edge in northern Vermont all the way down to the Narrows in Long Island. Uh, just one enormous lake. And then in uh, the, the Great Lakes region, there was Glacial Lake Iroquois, which impounded an even a more enormous amount of water, encompassing most of all of what was now the five uh, Great Lakes. And the only thing that was keeping Glacial Lake Iroquois water, which was at a generally higher elevation, from running into Lake Vermont was a small sill by the time things receded about 13,300 years ago in um, in northern New York or in southern uh, Ontario called Covey Hill. And at a certain point, that nick point between the two large glacial lakes gave way. And uh, as my colleagues David Franzi and um, John Rayburn note, that unleashed an enormous deluge where hundreds of feet of, of water that drained in the entire Lake Iroquois down through this gap in the glaciers. And if, if any of you today have been to the Altona Flat Rocks, they are called the Flat Rocks because it blasted all the soil off of all of those areas uh, as, a, as a, like a giant uh, pressure hose through these lakes. And then subsequently that increased meltwater blew out the dam at the Narrows in Long Island, as you can see in the southern end of this picture, and caused the draining of the Champlain uh, lowlands and the Hudson River Valley lowlands of, of Lake Vermont out through the continental shelf. After that, uh, the, the lake, what, the glacial lake forming wasn't done. There was another glacial lake that formed in Vermont, but with a dam near Whitehall, New York. Again, these glacial lakes were just ice water, meltwater, 
not filled with very many organisms at all. Um, uh, not probably completely barren, but you certainly couldn't catch, you hope to catch a fish in there if you threw a line. And this stage of uh, the Ford Ann stage lasted right until about 13,000 years ago when glacial ice receded north of the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the weight of all of the glaciers over what is now Vermont and New York and the Champlain Basin and, and in uh, the Quebec and Ontario lowlands made it so that those low-lying areas were actually below the, the level of the Atlantic at the time. And seawater came rushing in, and this began the tenure of the Champlain Sea, which lasted from about 13,000 years ago to about 9,500 years ago in various stages. And so what I'm going to talk about is, is my study area, which is the southern arm of the Champlain Sea, which corresponds to the Champlain Valley, or what we call the Champlain Basin, on both the New York and the Vermont sides, principally Vermont. And the Champlain Sea was not a barren sea at all. It was a very, very biotically productive sea. And uh, we know this because there have been a number of fossils that have been recovered from Champlain Sea sediments, uh, sediments including you know harbor seal and ring seal. I'll, sh I'll show in a minute. But narwhal. So I can just show you here. These are all radiocarbon dated uh, Champlain Sea remains: harbor seal, bowhead whale, uh, finback whale, ring seal, bearded seal, white whale. Uh, walrus uh, and and um, narwhal remains have been um, found, but they haven't been dated. So this uh, the, the Champlain Sea and the southern arm with which I am uh, particularly interested was um, a very biotically productive, although very cold uh, water body, much like the northern coast of Labrador today. And uh, other uh, studies have recovered the remains of cod minimally. Um, uh, and a variety of mollusks, suggesting that this would have been a very, very advantageous resource base for native people. The most recent date uh, was from the Charlotte whale, recovered in 1849 in Charlotte, Vermont, uh, but only recently dated to the earliest part of the Champlain Sea, probably around 13,000 years ago. And I just want to show this here because this is uh, my colleague David Anderson out of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville's um, ongoing effort to document all the discoveries of fluted points across North America, a quite amazing task. And what he notes uh, in the in the liner notes for this ongoing study, which I you know won't cite, but will paraphrase, is that um, all of the earliest and most notable Paleo-Indian sites in the Southwest, in, in uh, New Mexico and in Colorado, um, are quite actually few and far between. Those that, that, that codified in our ima imagination what Paleo-Indian native people should be are actually quite sparse in the landscape. And the, the vast majority of Paleo-Indian sites by number are in the eastern woodlands and areas that would have not been these areas where you had to go out on the barren plains and hunt megafauna or extinct bison or or anything else, but rather would have been um, varied uh, environments, including forests below the glacial line. So again, returning to what uh, the Champlain Sea, the southern arm of it in particular, would have looked like around 11,800 years ago, just a midpoint in the study. And while geologists in the last, and environmental scientists in the last 15 to 20 years were really honing in on the date of the Champlain Sea, which before that time was quite variable, uh, geologists could not agree on it because they were largely using shell dates, which as some of you might know, preserve old carbon um, that can skew dates uh, they, because shells sort of absorb um, lime from the surrounding rock. Um, so they began using only um, uh, sediment cores with 
plant dates in them, and which arrived at this date of around 13,000 years ago for the start of the Champlain Sea. Meanwhile, uh, AMS dating and better uh, excavation techniques and the increasing um, uh, recovery of Paleo-Indian archaeological sites, including Brian D. Jones, um, has meant that uh, a more precise dating of the Paleo-Indian period in the Northeast was possible. And so uh, what my colleagues and I did beginning, you know, um, you know, 10 years ago now, a little bit over, was say, okay, well, we know the Champlain Sea now uh, through a series of well-researched and published papers by a series of, of distinguished colleagues, um, began around 13,000 years ago and lasted uh, to around 9,500 years ago. And we know that that is the tenure of the Paleo-Indian period in Vermont. So we developed um, a map of the Champlain Sea at its maximum. And that's what you're seeing sort of here. Uh, the, the, the darker or the lighter blue, if you can see it underlying it, is the modern Lake Champlain level. And then we had to use a variety of proxies to develop a map of the Champlain Sea at its maximum, which has since been refined uh, greatly by colleagues at Norwich University and, and Vermont geologists, uh, to which I'm very grateful. And some of the more detailed maps here will, will actually be utilizing that this refined map. But these overall maps were, were made by me and colleagues, uh, you know, having to teach ourselves geology, so to speak. Um, and we were, I'm proud to say that we were, uh, maybe not in the minute details, but in, in the broader scheme of things, fairly, fairly accurate. So in the earliest uh, time period, which we define by changes in spear point styles and radiocarbon dates, but in, in Vermont, uh, there have as yet been no radiocarbon dated Paleo-Indian sites. So we're reliant upon changes in spear point morphology, but that has been backed up by a number of scholarly papers across the region, which it continues to be bolstered by radiocarbon dates, such as at Brian D. Jones. So what you notice here is the earliest period that we see in, um, in Vermont. And again, it, I say 2,900 to 2,400 calendar years before present. Uh, and I, I should note that I, I, I refer to calendar years because there is such a skew between radiocarbon years and calendar years at this point that um, it requires calibration programs. And just for the sake of ease, I'm using calendar years BP. Um, but as I said, that's the range of when this spear point style was made. Um, but I believe that Paleo-Indians would not have been able to reliably um, uh, inhabit the Champlain Basin uh, until about 12,700 years ago. And what we see here is that there's a notable cluster of Paleo-Indian sites where, again, this is utilizing the more nuanced model, where um, the Champlain Sea would have met the, the early um, Winooski River before it had cut into its banks, when it was probably cutting back and forth across the delta, carrying an enormous sediment load because of the loose glacial sediments that had been left behind. And yet it would have potentially made a sort of estuarine-like environment where fresh water was flowing into the saltwater sea. There would have been a variety of habitats to exploit. Um, and we see this notable concentration of Paleo-Indian sites in this what would have undoubtedly been a bi biotically productive area. Here's the Mahan site again, the biggest Paleo-Indian site yet excavated in Vermont. And at the time, this was excavated in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, it was a real um, uh, stumper why uh, Paleo-Indian native people would have been there. There were there was a subtle brook at the at the southern margin of it, but it was very rocky, stony soil. It was exposed. Um, it didn't seem like any place that nat later uh, native people uh, 
would have been interested in. And yet it was an enormous um, paleo Indian archaeological site, lightly um, light artifact density, but spread over an enormous area. Here's just a, a possible feature being excavated uh, at one of the areas in the site. And you can see um, you can see the amount the, the meter scale on the bottom and then the amount of excavation areas that that were were conducted a very very large area and and Peter Thomas um, uh, who was the principal investigator at the time surmised that this would have been a summer area because there wasn't much need for confining uh, activities under uh, under um, shelter that people were fairly free to spread out and and uh, conduct various tasks. It also could have been that it was uh, repeatedly occupied, although there's quite a uniformity of style in uh, materials and in um, and, uh, artifact styles. And regarding that, so this one site in Williston, Vermont, um, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but, but at the top two rows here and some of these materials are all um, chert from the Hudson Valley. The red material that you see in the bottom row is from Munsungan Lake in northern interior Maine. Um, the bottom right, uh, the yellow material is a is a, a jasper from Pennsylvania that is uh, you know perhaps earlier talks have discussed as widely used during the Paleo Indian period. And then the fluted point is made of local quartzite, which is very very difficult to work, although quite ubiquitous. And again, just a close-up LIDAR imagery um, of, of the area now. And you can see where, as opposed to being in the middle of nowhere, Mahan would have been close to a source of, of secondary running water, but near a tidal flat um, out uh, into um, easily uh, accessible to the, the potential biotic partic um, productivity of the Champlain Sea and the Winooski River. Next, we go to the next period, and I won't linger as long, but another notable Paleo-Indian site uh, near where uh, the Paleo-Lamoille River would have flowed into the Champlain Sea. And again, uh, at the same time period, this, this middle Paleo-Indian period known as uh, people making uh, Michaud Neponset points, um, two sites one located on what would have been an island in the champlain sea and one located on what would have been a peninsula um, and again at the top you can see the fluted point made of munsungan shirt on that island-like landform if it was at its maximum again tides are a big confounding factor here it could be that these were all accessible um, via walking via low tide um, and were only at high tide uh, you know cut off or only early on in the Champlain Sea stage, these things are still a little bit um, of a question mark. Oh, going back to the first one, sorry, this slide was out of order, but these are just some of the fluted points from the site near the confluence of the Lamoille River and the Champlain Sea. Um, recently, uh, this was only found in the last couple of years, but a uh, Paleo-Indian site in an inland travel corridor, um, again, made out of Munsungan chert. And one of the most interesting ones, uh, which I'll show a, a photo of it or a, an image of its location in a minute, is the Akimo site in uh, Ludlow, Vermont. This was nowhere near the Champlain Sea. This was in the middle of the Green Mountains uh, in um, a, a travel corridor, but quite high at elevation, almost a thousand feet, um, on a broad glacial plain. Um, now, uh, right near the Jackson Gore uh, development of the Chemo Mountain Resort. Um, just a view of where the loci were. There were two loci to the south that you see in this picture that were sort of se seemingly camping areas. Uh, we believe that these were all contemporaneous. 
and then Locust 2, which appears to have been a hunting lookout uh, overlooking the valley, which now has a, a, you know, a major uh, state road running through it, but back then would have been a narrow travel corridor through the Green Mountains. Just a few images of this. And what is notable about this archaeological site is that um, the spear points and all of the tools appear to have been extremely well curated or in otherwise well used to the point that nearly every large flake or piece of lithic debitage, every scraper was used to the, its end extremity. Um, it was, it, it, it appears that people were really running out of lithic materials to use, perhaps because they were crossing between two lithic poor areas. The, the biface fragments they were recovered were made on flakes rather than formal bifaces, suggesting again that they were really trying to utilize any technological advantage they had to make uh, spear points to su sufficient to get them through the crossing. Um, again, uh, up in the uh, upper right is a Pennsylvania Jasper Flake that's been exposed to heat but then subsequently reworked. And in the bottom is some kind of rhyolite. It was so degraded we had to dry it out in a bucket when we uh, originally excavated. We don't know what it's from, but it was extremely porous. Um, but you can see on the bottom left, it has been uh, um, uh, flaked with a number of broad flake scars uh, to, to uh, develop a broad scraping or cutting edge. And interestingly, we did found, uh, find one stone bead uh, within the uh, excavation, um, hinting that, uh, you know, quite rare in the Northeast, but some amount of decorative uh, ornamentation, which was lost at this site. Again, going on to the next period, we, we have um, the, the Champlain Sea was assuredly uh, being reduced by this time, was shrinking as isostatic rebound or the, the land rising back up after uh, the weight of the glaciers had been lifted off of it uh, was occurring, meaning that elevations were getting larger relative to the Atlantic Ocean and therefore um, sea levels were decreasing. In fact, the, the northern Champlain Valley is still rising about a, a millimeter a year. Um, but, uh, in any case, the latest Paleo-Indian period, Reagan site, a very famous Paleo-Indian site in the Northeast, uh, if the Champlain Sea was at its maximum, would have also been on an island like landform. Um, otherwise it would have been quite near the sea or on, uh, a, a former sea margin. Here um, in the Crowfield uh, or Cormier Nicholas um, subperiod is where we first see uh, Paleo Indian archaeological sites, of which there are admittedly few, uh, encroaching upon the maximum margins of the Champlain Sea. And again, this is almost assuredly because the Champlain Sea had receded and um, the, uh, the formerly inundated landforms were now available for habitation. They weren't just exposed, but grasses had come back. Uh, game was grazing out on them. They had become more environmentally tenable and people began to move out on them. And then finally, the late Paleo-Indian period, we see, um, uh, all, again, although sites are rare, we see uh, native people moving out into what were formerly inundated margins. Uh, in all areas except probably um, the deltas formed by the major rivers in Vermont, which were still probably very dynamic environments. Uh, sediment loads were still, you know, churning down these rivers, depositing lots of, um, of uh, sediment in, 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 uh, in what were then the lake and forming the deltas that we now know today, which were probably, but which were probably not very habitable environments at the time. Here's just an excavation of the Maza site, this late Paleo-Indian archaeological site um, uh, on a former Champlain Sea margin, but which had probably uh, been high and dry by this point, or definitely, actually. 
So, after all of the mapping of uh, 30 plus Paleo Indian archaeological sites and developing a model of the Champlain Sea and, and um, meeting with farmers and, and uh, collectors and scrutinizing the professional archaeological sites, what, what can we say? Well, we can say that um, the, the, Pale the Champlain Sea seems to have been a very powerful attractant to Paleo Indian pe native people. Um, that particularly there's notable large Paleo-Indian sites on uh, the, Masis the, the Winooski, the Lamoille, the Masiskoi, that again, the sample size is extremely s small, so this is only impressionistic, but that seem to have been occupied in a stepwise uh, fashion, um, perhaps as uh, isostatic rebound made certain um, river confluence areas uh, with the Champlain Sea more attractive. Nevertheless, uh, things that might have been islands or tidal flats were utilized. And um, that the, I, we argue that this couldn't have been a coincidence. Now, again, we haven't found uh, a, a fluted point embedded in a, in a whale skull at this point, you know, as much as we would love that direct corroboration. But our contention is that the resource of the Champlain Sea um, whether it be uh, marine mammals such as seals or perhaps even whales, but certainly seals, um, um, fish, mollusks were very attractive to Paleo-Indian native people uh, and that they were utilizing those resources and mapping themselves onto these, these uh, sea margin environments in order to take advantage of them. We also see that Paleo-Indian sites seem to, seem to be located near uh, glacial, glacially formed ponds and lakes. Um, these would have probably been very important sources of fresh water. Again, the running rivers and streams would have been, you know, carrying a lot of sediment from all the loose glacial sediment left over uh, from the retreating glaciers. Uh, they would have been very milky and, and brown, depending upon the season and the, and the storm regime. Uh, so, so clear uh, glacially formed kettle ponds and lakes would have been important resources. They would have also been important resources for emergent, uh, you know, what in the north are called muskeg or sort of northern wetlands, where uh, medicinal plants, um, plants uh, for fibers to make uh, cloth and baskets and other things might have been procured. Again, all speculation at this point, but just looking at the environmental regimes. And then the last was uh, travel corridors, uh, much like we talked about with Jackson Gore a few minutes ago through this Rutland, uh, Ludlow corridor. They were also important. And toward that end, a number of years ago, colleagues and I, as, a, as an initial step, uh, again, whether it be John and I, um, just ran a very simple geographic information systems least cost path analysis. So this was simply saying, if you were at, uh, during the Paleo-Indian period, if you were at the mouth of one of these major rivers um, and you wanted to get to the Connecticut, what would be the simplest ways to cross the state? And um, you can see the green or the, the, the easiest, the most likely, and this is based almost entirely upon slope um, the, the logic being uh, human people wouldn't want to go up and down huge, large slopes of varying terrain, but rather stick to the more level, low-lying terrain, minimize their effort. And um, what I'd like to call your attention below is the Otter Creek Basin. And let's see. Oh, this is just through time. I'm sorry. Um, and here's the Jackson Gore site, uh, that, that very tenuous but interesting Paleo-Indian site uh, where uh, um, stone materials seem to have been in very short supply on the edge of uh, one of the major traversable, traversable valleys or corridors through the Green Mountains. And then uh, as a second step, we said, okay, well, we, we don't know a lot about the Paleo-Indian people in our state or really anywhere, but we do know that they utilized, uh, much like um, their brethren in, in the West, um, 
stones from very high quality but very disparate uh, sources. Again, uh, Hudson Valley, uh, Monsungan Lake, and Pennsylvania. And here on the left, you can see those sources highlighted a straight line distance of roughly 850 kilometers through varying mountain mountainous terrain, uh, including the greens and the whites and uh, the hill and range country in between. And so we queried, um, again, GIS modeling. Oh yeah, here's just a, just some pointing out where some of these sources are from. So again, with some GIS modeling, uh, this time taking into account the Champlain Sea, varying terrain, flow of rivers, uh, trying to extrapolate back then what they might have been like and the direction of the rivers, uh, variable forest cover. We we developed what is cost uh, what is called a um, a weighted cost surface, and the most notable thing I want to highlight is that. Um, we should have known this when we were running the analysis, but it was actually quite shocking to us. And that if you wanted to get from the Mahan site to the Munsungan Lake Chert source or vice versa, uh, again, depending upon the flow of the river, um, the, by far the easiest way would have been to traverse along the Champlain Sea all the way up to what is now uh, the Etchemin River and then cut in to the west branch of the Penobscot to the, to the Monsungan Lake source. Uh, again, there's some lighter green that cut through the White Mountains, but you can see the dark, dark green uh, indicates that in aggregate, uh, traveling along the Champlain Sea would have been the easiest route to, to that uh, disparate source. Again, um, going from the Hudson Valley to, to either the Mahan site or the Jackson Gore site, the Champlain Sea would have been by far the easiest area tr to traverse. A little bit more of a no-brainer. And the only other area that would have been through the mountains would be to the Mount Jasper Rhyolite source in, um, in New Hampshire to, say, the Lamoille Valley River where we saw that material expressed at the Fairpack Sambolo site. So uh i'll skip that but just a brief aside is to say that um recent research in uh champlain sea tides has suggested that it was a mesotidal system so quite a significant tide which likely would have been even more extreme in its southern arm so there might have been a very very distinct uh tidal regime where uh when the tide went out you could walk across the mud flats um, across the valley if you timed yourself right and when it came in you would quickly be inundated again depending upon through time a lesser extent isostatic rebound this would have meant that you know in certain periods you could walk across uh, the Champlain um, uh, Valley or, or what is now Lake Champlain quite easily particularly in its southern arm um, and in other areas you might have to navigate quite tricky uh, tides But you could have also made boats. Uh, wood would have been very sparse and not enough to make dugout canoes or likely birch bark um, um, boats. But uh, hide boats would have been certainly within the realm of possibility of Paleo-Indian people. Other people have, have suggested this before, um, like this image of uh, uh, modern Arctic native people today. And uh, perhaps would have been an easy way to traverse uh, across the length and breadth of the Champlain Sea. It also could be that you traveled along the, the margins of the Champlain Sea, basically walking along the beaches as an easy way to, to get uh, to where you're going. Or, much like Arctic peoples today, um, you could have traveled it in the winter when it is likely that um, at least the southern arm of the Champlain Sea was uh, covered in ice. We know this because um, harbor seal and other, uh, one other variety of seal require land fast ice to raise their pups. And those, uh, those um, seal remains have been found uh, 
in the Champlain Valley, uh, Champlain Sea sediments, suggesting that at least in the winter, for up for at, you know some long period of time, uh, ice was locked up in the winter, which would have have enabled uh, traverse by a um, snowshoe or or a dog sled. There's no contention now or direct evidence that they have those technologies, but um, certainly uh, they would have been these landforms would have been utilizable. Again, just a reminder of what the Champlain Sea would have. Oh, and also that narwhal um, require land fast ice during certain seasons for feeding, and their remains have been found in Champlain Sea sediments. Looking outside of the Champlain Valley, just very briefly, there's been over the last 15 years or so research all the way across the continent off the Channel Islands in California um, that shows a non-fluted point uh, group of people utilizing the sea as um, their primary resource uh, at a time period commensurate with Paleo-Indians in the Northeast, um, it, it developing a whole different suite of technologies to procure uh, ocean um, uh, mammals and, uh, and seafood. And in our neck of the woods, uh, the continental shelf was, uh, was much more exposed uh, throughout much of the Paleo-Indian period. And we know that Paleo-Indians were utilizing the continental shelf because uh, fluted points have been found in places like Nantucket and these from Martha's Vineyard, uh, photographic uh, courtesy of uh, Jim Richardson and Bill Moody, that um, show us that people were walking to the outer edges of the continental shelf, perhaps like the people in the Champlain Valley, utilizing uh, aquatic resources about which we would otherwise have no information. And indeed, um, the problem with uh, this nuanced understanding of Paleo-Indian peoples is that the continental shelf, as, as many or most of you well know, has been inundated by rising sea levels since the Paleo-Indian period. Um, and so while not impossible to study sites of that antiquity, uh, the technologies are just being developed and the area to survey is extremely broad. But uh, unlike all those other areas, the Champlain Valley is almost unique in that it has been rising since the late Pleistocene. The isostatic rebound has meant that the shorelines are just arising more and more uh, um, and are not inundated by rising sea levels and they're, therefore uh, offer uh, a really unique opportunity in the Northeast and really in, in much of North America to study how uh, Paleo-Indian native people uh, would have utilized these ancient environments. Many have already been built on. Uh, in fact, that area where the three dots that I showed you uh, of the three notable Paleo-Indian sites in Williston are now where um, sort of our big box door area is located. But some are still intact and, and um, uh, are worthy of, of future survey. And uh, let me just check my time. Um, I'll just say as a last point that um, recent research by, by me has suggested that after the tenure of fluted point uh, producing people, what people call the early and middle Paleo-Indian period, uh, commonly and here in the Northeast and in New England in particular, um, there appears to have been people that produced afterward uh, these, um, these very gracile uh, lancelet spear points uh, called late Paleo-Indian St. Anne Varney farm points. Uh, people also began to produce um, um, bifurcate-based points. There's a, a, a phenomenon of archaeological sites dating to this time period that have no spear points associated with them, but very commonly uh, largely or, or, or exclusively court scrapers, and then largely a mortuary phenomena, uh, commonly defined by um, uh, red ochre stained pits and uh, stone rods. And what I have seen and what I've compiled and presented in a couple papers, and I'll just scroll through very quickly now, is that there was a period of abandonment between what you can see on the left is uh, fluted point producing, 
uh, groups and what on the right are the all the groups that came after, which could have been as much as 800 or 772 uh, calendar years, as far as I'm able to discern, um, which meant that there was really something going on after people stopped making fluted points, that there was either a period of abandonment or popu radical population decline, uh, that, that the environment changed so much perhaps that that people who had been living a way of life for nearly 3,000 years um, could no longer do it effectively, and that it was only uh, some hundred years later where the technologies uh, more adapted to boreal forest, to, to fishing, to small game hunting came in where populations began to rebound. And I, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Um, and please, audience members, if you have questions, pop them in the chat or the Q&A. There is already one in place. It's very specific, and it will reference your slides. Um, but it says, Dr. Robinson, could you please, on one of the Champlain C images, locate with your cursor the sites Gordon Nielsen ID'd to me as VTAD1 and VTAD2 at the confluence of Otter and Dead Creeks, also known as Donovan's River's Edge? Um. I can't do that um, because it it, um, it it would involve me going back way. But um, one of those dots did locate um, Gordon Nielsen's site at the confluence of the dead um, and the otter uh, in the middle Paleo Indian period, and that site was very confounding because um, because it was. Uh, and, and again, um, you know, I, I have great respect for the early generations of collectors that really tried to document their locations well. Um, there was also some rivalry between them, which makes a, it a little bit, um, um, you know, I have to have a, a, a grain of skepticism, some of them. But I interviewed a lot of them and and and, um, and including Gordon Nielsen and um, and um, Langdon Smith and Bud Bodette and and what it seems to me is that um, this would have been an area that um, the tidal um, where it was no longer at its maximum and that it was probably it was in the southern arm of the Sh Champlain Valley and it seems like it might have been an, a, an isolated drop while people were crossing the tidal flats at low tide um, because because it, it seems to make sense environmentally. Uh, you know, alternatively, it could be, you know, we could be all wrong. I don't think so. It could be, it could have been, um, you know, a paleo Indian person going across on a boat and dropping it. But it wasn't a, uh, an area, if you drew the maximum Champlain Sea, would have been um, regularly uh, below water. So the, the reasons why it was there are very intriguing. Thank you. Um, and then I was just going to ask, while I give everyone a chance to type, um, the time period where you talk about there being really a pause, um, yeah. do, which factors do you think contribute to that? Is that environmental? Are you still studying it? And then does that is that what becomes a catalyst for some of that technology change? Yeah, I, I do think that it's largely environmental. I think that um, this was a as my talk intimated, I think that people were mapped on to um, caribou, which was certainly an important seasonal resource, but also I would say seasonally at least maritime resources, uh, aquatic resources. Um, they were certainly choosing to live quite near the Champlain Sea, um, at least as far as climate change. Could it have been a climate change? Yeah, so it's 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 isostatic. One of it is isostatic rebound. Um, the, the Champlain Sea, the, the land is rising, the sea is getting shallower and shallower. As it gets shallower and shallower, I'm sure it became less environmentally productive. The seals and the mollusks, you know, became brackish because freshwater is still running in. So it, it eventually became not a great place to, to, to live by for a while, became, you know, brackish and, and not, not a great environment for for aquatic or terrestrial um, uh, or freshwater or seawater life. I also think the environmental regime, yes, climate change was changing. Trees were growing up, but they were largely boreal forestry, you know, pines and coniferous trees, which, um, you know, are not as biotically productive or produce as much 
um, viable nuts and other things that that uh, animals can live on as deciduous forests. Um, it was a time when uh, the rivers were still cutting through their banks and you know moving all over and carrying a heavy sediment load. So there weren't freshwater fish yet. Um, and so I think it just became very, very tenuous to live there. I'm, I'm not advocating for a full abandonment, but I think that there was probably a, 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 a large population decline, particularly in northern New England. I, southern New England might have been somewhat different from this, although I have to say I've, I've aggregated now hundreds of radiocarbon dates and none of them that are precise enough to really evaluate this fall within that gap yet. So, so okay. um, can I ask you about the Okemo site? Sure. You, you said it was an odd thing. It could have been along a corridor. Could it also have been because that's like kind of the beginning of the highest area because the Green Mountains go right through there that that could have been good caribou hunting areas where they could look down over? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I think that that is certainly one reason why they were there and they knew about this site. I just think from my interpretation of the of the archaeological assemblage, if they had gone there solely to hunt caribou, they would have been better prepared. Uh, you know, they 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 were really, really down on their luck, at least um, uh, lithic material wise. Every like little flake that was found of significant size appears to have been utilized. Um, they were they were they were trying to make fluted points out of anything they had. So there's no doubt that they were taking advantage of that corridor. But I think it was probably, and again, this is just, you know, um, conjecture, educated conjecture on my part, their main purpose was traveling either to the Champlain Basin or from it. Um, and they were they were trying to take advantage of game as they went through uh, because um, they, if, if, or if not, they really didn't pack for the journey or, you know, as is the case with CRM, maybe maybe we missed the giant campsite that was uh, just outside of our project APE. Although, you know, we did a broad area of testing for this particular area, so I think that's less likely. Well, so. And when did Lake Champlain become Lake Champlain that we know now? I right around 9,500, although it was lower, it became yeah. fresh around 9,500, although it was lower for about a thousand years than it is now. So that Missisquoi Bay, was basically a giant wetland bog. Parts of St. Albans Bay were dry. Um, and then it slowly began infilling again. And then are you are there colleagues north of the border in Canada over Montreal, Quebec, where the water did go up? Are they find are they did they find sites as well? Is that going on? They have um they have been looking. My my colleagues Claude Chapdelaine and Adrian Burke um, at the, from the University of Montreal, they have found one Paleo Indian site in Quebec. Um, on Lake Megantic, which is just over the border from from Maine, and and otherwise no Paleo Indian sites in Quebec, which is very interesting. Oh. Um, I would assume there's some along those former glacial lake margins, but it's it's very sort of remote, and the and the the as far as I understand the the drop off isn't that severe. So you'd, you'd really have to do a targeted survey of where you thought the maximum shorelines were in these areas to, to, to try to, to try to pin down some paleo Indian sites. Mm -hmm. I actually think one of the most interesting areas that's yet been explored is Northern New York, like the Chazy area. Um, but no one has really done any um, dedicated research there. There's then been some collectors that have had some interesting, um, um, stuff there, but, but not a lot of professional area. So. Okay. Our next two questions are um, tied to the humans of the era. Um, you talked about the artifacts and the things left at the site. Have any human remains been found from this period? No human remains. No. And in fact, no faunal remains of, of any kind um, such that we might be able to radiocarbon date something uh, and no indication that there were any um, human burials anywhere. These, these were, um, in all cases uh, that that we have sufficient information for sort of uh, logistical or, or everyday encampments. Nothing that would suggest a, a ceremonial or religious or cosmological purpose. 
Okay. Um, and the next question is, is there any evidence or a possibility, and you had hinted at this in one of your previous answers, for suggesting that the separate sites along a corridor could actually be related to a single or a common group? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, we just don't have that resolution now. Um, we can date, uh, in the absence of radiocarbon dates, based upon the style of, of fluted points, we can we can date things to you know roughly 500 800 year slices but no way to confirm contemporaneity or or um or even you know direct ancestry of people moving back and forth through we just don't have that resolution unfortunately although it's certainly something we contemplate when we when we look at this stuff um and then finally any final thoughts for our audience before we wrap up for the evening um no, just thank you very much. I have no idea how many people tuned in, but um, I'm really grateful to have done this and to be part of a, an esteemed group of people talking about the Paleo-Indian period in New England. And um, and uh, I'm really grateful for for all of you all to, it, you're, you're unprecedented in your ability to reach out to me almost a year before. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, I, I appreciate that. And um, I'm grateful to be a part of it. And um, I'm also grateful to, to uh, and excited to see what still comes out of the Brian D. Jones site. There's still stuff to be, to be learned and details to be parsed. And, um, you know, I, I await bated breath with all of that. We all do too. We all yeah. do too. <laughs> and it's going to yeah. come soon. I think it's, it's yeah. going to be, happening. it's happening. So thank you very much. We appreciate this. This has been terrific to kind of go North a little bit and see what you all have going on and, and to just understand how they did move all around. And, and it still amazes a lot of us that they moved as much as they did and you can follow these things and they brought all these materials everywhere. That's just fascinating. It's yeah. uh, okay. like, you know, they knew where to go. That was good. Thank, right. you. thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you everyone. We'll see you next month. Have a good night. Yep. Thanks very much.